He said, they lead us, the sheep astray to fleece the sheep. That's what they do. How many times have we seen that? Those old sorry televangelists on TV, they accumulate money and cars and ranches and houses and what have you. Take all that they can from folks, usually folks that don't have it to give, and teach a false doctrine to line their pockets. They're greedy. Their greed takes the form of money and materialism. Their greed also takes another form, and that's power. Power. These false teachers are charismatic, egotistical, full of themselves. They think they are cute. See, Jesus is the head of the church, the true church. He's the head of the body. And He should be preeminent in all things, but especially His church. They don't want Jesus to be preeminent. They don't want Him to be Lord of the church. They don't want Him to be head over the body. They don't want Him to have all the power. They want it for themselves. So they brainwash people, indoctrinate people to get power and authority. They're in the mold of Satan, their father. Satan was a usurper. He wanted the limelight on him. He wanted to be God from the beginning. And they're his agents, and they act like that. They've got a greedy, insatiable appetite for power. Another form that their greed takes is sex. These teachers are charismatic, egotistical, influential, and so many times they do what they do to feed their flesh. How many times have you heard of some kind of false prosperity gospel teacher teaching something that goes against the Word of God? How many times have you heard about them taking another man's wife? Having an affair with somebody within the church. They're lustful. They're feeding the flesh and they're teaching that false doctrine to get what they want. To get what they want. That's their motivation. Oh, it's shady. They don't want to see Christ glorified. They don't want to see the church of Jesus Christ built up. They want to feed them and stoke their pride. One more point. I'm going to close. That's a hard message, isn't it? That's some sad, terrible things that we've heard today. But we're going to end on a it's a positive note depending on what side you're on. The last thing that we see about the devil's double agents is their sure judgment. Their sure judgment. Look at the last part of verse 3. Peter tells this beleaguered church something that's encouraging. These apostates, these heretics coming up, it may have surprised them. It may have surprised their pastor. It may have surprised their leadership. But there's one that it did not surprise. It didn't surprise the Lord. He knew that they were coming. And they've been foreordained for judgment. Notice what it says. Their judgment from long ago is not idle. And their destruction is not asleep. Their judgment from long ago is not idle. And their destruction is not asleep. What Peter says here is that they may prosper now. They may have a ready audience. Multitudes may follow them. They may seem to do so well and prosper. But it's not going to be like that forever. A day will come when God will scrutinize them. He will scrutinize their lives, their works, and their teaching. And if it does not line up with the Word of God, they will be judged by the very Word that they rejected and turned their backs on. Notice a couple of things that he tells us about this sure judgment. One, it's imminent. It's imminent. He says there, our ju- that judgment from long ago is not idle. See, a lot of these sinners, these false teachers, these apostates, they think because the judgment of God is not immediate, that it's not imminent. That it won't be forthcoming. They think that they've gotten away with it that they've torn a church up, that they've exploited weak believers and led them astray. They think that they've gotten away with it because God didn't deal with them instantly. Boy, are they wrong. His judgment may not be immediate, but it is imminent. You know what imminent means? Certain. Sure. 
you're able to bank on. Have you ever heard somebody say the only sure thing in life is death and taxes? You can add a third thing to that. The only sure thing in life is death, taxes, and the judgment of God. He will judge. Your sins will find you out. It may not be this side of eternity, but there will come a time when the light of God will shine on your works and you'll be scrutinized and judged. Another thing about the judgment of these heretics, it's not only imminent, it's intimate. Intimate. Do you realize that the church of Jesus Christ is precious to the Father? The church is described as the bride of Jesus. The church is described as the body of Christ over which He is the head. The church is those that Jesus has shed His blood to redeem, to obtain. We are precious. Precious to God. That means that when His church is hurt, when His flock is preyed on by wolves, He takes it personal. And He's going to personally judge. That judgment's going to be intimate. One day in eternity, they're going to stand before God and they're going to give an account. He's going to reveal the works that they've done and He's going to say, you have hurt my church. You have led folks astray You've done it, now I'm going to judge you. It's going to be intimate. Because God takes His church seriously. Takes it personally. When believers are wounded, led astray, and a church is torn up by ravenous wolves. Having said that this morning, that their judgment is sure, I want to ask you, what side of the judgment are you on? Huh? What side of this judgment are you going to be on? Are you going to be that righteous remnant who stands upon the Word of God in season and out, who's willing to be reviled, called a bigot, persecuted? Are you going to be willing to stand upon those promises and be on the right side of judgment in eternity? Or are you going to follow what's popular? Are you going to go the way of the world today and face the fate of the world tomorrow? I want to give you the opportunity to respond to this message in two ways. Two responses. I believe, and I'm biased, but I believe that Second Baptist is a very biblically sound church. That we are a doctrinally sound church. It is the grace of God that keeps us that way. We need to be praying for this church. Don't think for a second that Satan does not know our doctrinal soundness and does not hate it. He wants to attack it. It is by the grace of God that we stand. I want to invite you to come and pray for this church that we would stay committed to the Word of God, that we would let Jesus be the head of the church, that we would not dilute in any form or fashion the gospel. Or maybe today, as I have preached this message, you realize that you could very easily be led astray. You don't really know who you are in Christ. You don't know this book. You're not committed to the church. You're not sound in what you believe and you know under the right circumstances you could hear the counterfeit and accept it as the truth and be led astray to damnation. Why don't you come today and make a commitment to be a man or woman of the book? To know who you are in Christ and make a commitment to study this book. As we have this time of decision, as Brother Terry comes, as Miss Debbie plays.